Hear now these words from Paul's letter to the Colossians. These verses come to us from the first chapter, verses 15 through 28. Listen to God's word. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Christ is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile God's self all, to all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of Christ's cross. And you, who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, Christ has now reconciled in his body through death, so as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him, provided that you continue securely established and steadfast in faith, without shifting from the hope promised by the gospel you have heard, which has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. I, Paul, became a servant of this gospel. So I am now rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. I became its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations, but has now been revealed to Christ's saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is he whom we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. This is the word of our God. Thanks be to God. So we're not going to get through all of that, but we'll get through part of that. Let us pray. Gracious God, we gather to sing your praises, for you have come to us in the flesh. In Christ, your word, your love, your reconciliation, our hope made visible. We know that you are with us always, so help us to draw near to you in this time. Open our eyes and ears and hearts and minds to you and your word. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation on all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O oh God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. So my dad and I would get into the car after seeing his oncologist. And we would have the kind of conversations that I imagine most families have in those situations. We would recap what the doctor had said, making sure we both heard the details correctly. Weight, height, tumor size, location, timelines. Then we'd drive down the road and say, well, what do you think? Kind of in this really practical way. And we would name the hard stuff, saying, well, it sounds like the doctor was surprised the cancer spread on that medication. Yep, sounds like he's never seen that before. Then we would say things like this. Well, I don't like that you have a tumor in your thigh, but it's really good there's no cancer in your liver. And would nod in agreement and say, yep, that is true. Then would say, I'm really sorry that the radiation is making your favorite meals taste funny. And if you met my dad, his favorite meal was pork chops on a Monday night. <laughs> That's why I was a vegetarian for 18 years. Um, so would not, would say, I'm sorry that the 
that I'm sorry that the radiation is ruining your favorite meal, but hey, at least you can eat ice cream. And we'd nod and say, yep, yep. So from the time that we had learned of the spot on my father's lung that was found incidentally on a CT scan, we would say things like this, like, well, it is really scary that there's a spot on your lung, but it could be a million things. To, okay, well, we know it was cancer, but it was caught early. Or, I know the treatment you're going through is rough, but it's a good thing that you were really, um, that you were in really good health apart from the cancer. We would look for that silver lining like many of us are compelled to do because it softens those hard edges of life. It soothes the sting and it gives us permission to hold on to hope in some way or shape or form. So for nearly two years, we would kick that can of hope down the road until our greatest hopes were that my father would pass away in his own home with his three girls by his side. And that hope was realized at, the, at early April of this year. Now, we do this all the time, right? When the world is confusing or difficult, and when the world dishes us information and diagnoses and news headlines that try to make an argument that the world is not to be trusted, we look for good. We search for meaning. We try to find some direction. We search for the cosmic and practical assurance that those forces that feel like all they want to do is destroy or harm, that those forces are not the sole arbitrators of our future. And so we name this quest for possibility, for life-giving possibility, hope. It orients us beyond the difficulty of the present moment, and it pulls our energy forward to something good. It helps us find some strength, and it gives us a reason to wake up and to work and to celebrate birthdays and to do something kind for a neighbor or a stranger. Hope is, in my experience, like that handle that we reach for in a subway or that pole we grab for on a crowded bus that helps us steady ourselves when we are on a bumpy ride. It keeps us on our feet and gets us through the potholes till we can get to our destination and exhale for a minute. Bishop Tutu says it way more eloquently than that when he says, hope is being able to see that there is light despite all the darkness. Now, hope is a familiar word. It's part of the lexicon of our faith. The psalmist reminds us that those who hope in God will renew their strength, soar on wings like eagles, run without growing weary, walk and not faint. And the prophet Jeremiah even offered these words of hope to the exiles by saying that God is a God who makes hope happen. In fact, hope is part of the future for which God has planned. And Paul writes in his letter to the Romans and to in all of the epistles again and again that hope is not only a quality used by individuals to shore themselves up when life is tough, but a gift of assurance, a gift from God. All right, now I admit that the scripture passages that we heard earlier on in our service today did not dish out dynamics of hope. They do not tell us to do it. They do not give us examples of it. They don't even assure us that hope is available to us along the way. In fact, some of the biblical words that the Logan family read for us earlier give us the opposite. I mean, the prophet, Isaiah, uh, the prophet Amos, whew, those words are shocking to hear. Amos is giving us a vision of destruction that would befall an entire people because of injustice and economic abuses of those who are most vulnerable in the world. Amos calls out the people of faith and saying that their belief was not enacted in the day-to-day -day living of their lives. And Amos tells them they're not going to get away with it, but rather God is 
painting this portrait of apocalypse, this apocalyptic scene of judgment and mourning and bitterness and estrangement from God. And even in those few lessons of our gospel from today, Mary and Martha surely don't offer hope for then the flip side for those of us who are busybodies trying to put our ethics into work and our love for Jesus Christ into action. We are even told that we have it wrong somehow. We should sit still at Jesus' feet. So, but these two passages, as different as they are, do have something in common because they point out to us how often good people and faithful people just get it wrong. Like ancient Israel, we are reminded by the prophet Amos that too often we put the acquisition of material wealth above the true virtues of our faith. We say one thing, we do another. We act as if we are beyond reproach because we know that our identity is secured as a people of God. But we fail to live as if the sacred identity has changed us at all. We talk the talk, but don't walk the walk. And what's more, we even do harm in God's name. We, a people of faith, conform to systems of hierarchical power in the world and sell ourselves out. We use our own wealth or power or prestige not only to satisfy our own needs and desires, but even to bring harm upon others especially the most vulnerable, and often in Christ's name. We say we're better than others. We relegate who is welcome, who is not. We cast stones and judgments and even votes to help hold our place secure in the world. And candidly, even if we're not one of those Christians, we might count ourselves, like I do, among the Marthas of the world. We lay awake at night, to-do lists running through our head, distracted, busy, plugged in, available all the time to all of the people. We're burnt out and grouchy and certain we have secured our place in the kingdom. But all the while, we have lost focus from the one from whom all blessings flow. So, family, I need these reminders. I know I need to look at how I spend my money and my time, and I know that I need to repent of being too distracted, too self-righteous, too plugged in, too focused on me. But, maybe I should say and, life is hard. I know that I am not the only one who lies awake at night and worries about the state of the world in which my child lives. I know that I'm not the only one who lies awake at night stressing over the best order to tackle all of the things expected of me. I know I'm not the only one who doom scrolls or who puts on a brave face or who takes a deep breath before I speak because the filters that once edited my speech pretty well aren't working so well anymore. <laughs> They are worn out. <laughs> I know I am not the only one who wants to trust that goodness is stronger than evil and love is stronger than hate. And I know I'm not the only one who wants to envision and work for a better future so that when, God willing, I have grandchildren, there will be enough honeybees and a cooler climate, and a rich celebration of the diversity of humanity, and a shared articulation of human rights, and maybe even a little peace on earth. And so in the midst of these tensions of faith and doubt, of fear and assurance, of sickness and health, of grief and joy, I hold on to hope. And I have the nerve to ask you to do the same. And I know it takes a lot of nerve to do that. But I am here to remind you that we worship a God who has not given up on any of us. 
we read in the letter to the Colossians a hymn to Christ that confirms our impulse to hope. Because Paul assures the church that Jesus is who Jesus is, a reconciler, a redeemer, the fullness of God's love. Christ is at work in and through the spiritual, relational, and societal tensions of our day as the force that orients us back to God's love again and again and again. It is in Christ that we have security and even certainty that the powers of hostility and estrangement and evil are no match for the love of God in Christ. What's more, this passage assures us that Christ is the force that draws us together. It is through Christ that we can claim any unity in our diversity. It is through Christ that we are empowered to enact the love that God first showed us. We are more than solitary selves trying to grab on to a handle on a bumpy bus ride. We are more than our worst or best action. We are more than our greatest fear and our grandest hope. We are the body of Christ. We are reconcilers and we are reconciled. We are called to love because we have been loved. Paul even writes that in us dwells the hope of glory. God in Christ in us. And so this impulse to hope is not in vain. It's not foolish or naive, though there are lots of people who will say it is so, but rather our text for today affirms it. For we believe and worship a God who is at work right now, right here, in this world, in us. Like, look around. Lots of Christ at work. And we profess that the power of God's redemptive love in Christ is stronger than all of the forces among or within us that destroy or deceive or kill and even when we are looking death in the eye, we can, like Job, profess that I know my Redeemer lives. As my dad and I planned his funeral mass last summer at his kitchen counter, we talked about the surprising serenity that had overwhelmed his fears. Having made peace in this life, he had in his heart a piece of the promised life that was to come. His faith had offered him the assurance that although his body would not prevail over this cancer, Christ would. And Christ had claimed him in this life and would usher him into the life that is to come. So he chose a hymn to close his service, and it is a hymn we will use to close our service today. It mirrors our epistle lesson for today, for it is a Christ hymn as well, a contemporary one. Now, my father is Catholic, and so he made sure that we sang all the verses because that's not always done. But the hymn affirms to us what the words of our epistle lesson do, that in life and in death, we belong to God, a God who is merciful and just, a God who is compassionate and loving, a God who took on flesh and dwelt among us so that we might have life and have it abundantly. In Christ, friends, we have a reason to hope. A hope we can hope because we are loved. We can hope because we are created and called to a purpose. We have hope because we are connected to one another, not alone in this life that we live. We can have hope because we are some part of something bigger than ourselves. We can hope because we are forgiven. We can hope because God's grace is more powerful than any force in this world that seeks to harm or destroy or tear down. 
And we can have hope because in all moments of all times, we are held in the palm of God's hand. So friends, today and tomorrow and all the days, when life is ride is bumpy, when we are irritated, when our filters are totally shut off, may we find hope in the promises of our faith. And may we live into the hope that is God's gift to us. God loves us. Let us have hope. Thanks be to God. Amen.